he wanted to write James Thurber style humor. Okay. You know, he loved that. He used to push it on me all the time. Okay. Um, he used to, as I said at his memorial service, he literally would say something to me like, go, go make fun of people, but your dad. The granddaughter of one of Canada's most illustrious prime ministers and the daughter of a diplomat and a senator, Patricia Pearson is a writer and journalist who's written for The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Guardian, and dozens of other publications, as well as having written two novels and four non-fiction books, the latest being Opening Heaven's Door, What the Dying May Be Trying to Tell Us About Where They're Going. We met Pat Pearson in the midst of a book tour in Toronto. Patricia, I want us to ask you a little bit about... Um your background and, and whether writing was what you always wanted to do from the from early on, was it? Yeah, actually yeah. it was. I started writing when I was eight. When Basically you were eight? when I could write I started writing. Really? Yeah. What do you know why? What what prompted it? Were you a big reader? Um, I don't know. I don't remember if I was a big reader, but I just had all these stories in my head. My first story was about a family of lint that lived in a dryer. And then <clears throat> they um for some reason some calamity ensued. I can't remember what. <laughs> And then they had to. Uh, they had to. A move. sheet of bounce came in. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they had to move to a tuna fish can in the garden, <laughs> so it was kind of like a, an, uh, an adventure story. Wow, so this is it's like the literary version of Judy Garland and, and Mickey Rooney. You know, let's put on a show. <laughs> let's write a story. That's amazing. Yeah. The, and and you've been, but that was a continual thing. You just you yeah. when you went to school, everything was geared that way for you. Uh, I, I didn't think I was going to be professionally a writer. I mm. wanted to be a professor of history. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, and in fact, I've ever since, I mean, I did some PhD work in history at the University of Chicago, and I, I've pretty much woven my historical interests into a lot of my journalism. Right. Have you d ever taken writing courses or anything, creative writing courses or anything like that, or is this just something that you just do? <laughs> Well, I honed it at the Columbia, yeah. so I did that master's in journalism, right. and that really did. I remember taking a course in with a professor named Judith Christ. I don't know if you remember yes. her as a journalist. I mean, yes, absolutely. And she was the one who really, who really kicked the sort of academic quality out of my writing. Okay. And then I was able from there to just kind of polish it. And I, at some point, I remember like deliberately teaching myself how to write humor. So that was a kind of self-taught process. How did you, you do that? Um, I just played around and played around and played around with timing, with tone, with voice. Um, Were you influenced by other writers, or is that something you steer clear of? Um, I, I would tend to steer clear of other writers for my serious writing, but I think that in terms of humor, I was probably influenced by oh, Mark Twain, actually that kind of quality of yeah, sort of okay. faux naivete in the writing, people okay. like that. Did, do you remember stuff in that vein that you wrote that you looked at and went, no, and threw away? Stuff that you thought, I, I'm not there yet? Yep. Was there a lot of it? Um, I don't think so. I think it was, it was a year I was living in New York. I was in my 20s. <clears throat> and I was trying to get out this piece about how my boyfriend had dumped me in a restaurant during his lunch hour. And it, it, there was something so inherently absurd and hilarious about what he'd done that I wanted to write about it, but it, it took me that over the course of that year to get it right. And then from then, I was pretty comfortable with humor writing. So what about then, I mean, it's one thing to write, it's another thing to write and actually be able to sell it to somebody, to peddle it to somebody. Mm -hmm. How difficult was that for you early on? Uh, well, when I was still at Columbia, I, was, um, I sold stuff to Spy Magazine in the early 90s, yeah. so this was Graydon Carter and Kurt Anderson yes. who were editing. Um, <clears throat> and that was through s sort of sheer buoyancy and persistency. Um, I'd written a piece about, I'd gone to Philadelphia, and um, there was a weekend where cops were teaching other cops how to hunt for Satan killers, or Satan, Satanists. Satanists, yeah, yeah. all right, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this guy had written, this cop had written a book called The Satan Hunter. So these were all these kind of like, you know, um, kind of... <laughs> That's just too rich a vein. Dim, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was so funny, and, and you know, it just wrote itself. And so yeah. I sold that to Spy Magazine. And then, um, y you know, it's always just that question of really believing in what you're doing and, and yeah. phoning and phoning and phoning. But the Americans are a lot more receptive to a stranger, a young writer, than Canadian establishment Is was. that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wonder why that is. <clears throat> I don't know. I think, I think there's... Too a much of a closed shop here, maybe? I is think it's too much of a closed shop. I remember being in in the 
1989, just after the wall, f just after the wall fell, mm -hmm. and, the, and the Soviet Union had suddenly become a democracy, and it had no idea how to be a democracy. And there was a huge conference in um, England where all these people from all over the world were coming to teach them, like, everything from how to police to what to do with prostitutes to, you know, how to run a judicial system to, like, like completely the grassroots teaching of this entire infrastructure. It was an amazing conference, and I was there, and I wrote about it freelance and faxed it to the Globe. And they said, well, you know, we, we can't take this. We don't know who you yeah, who are. are. Who are you? Who are you? Yeah. Whereas in the States, that wouldn't happen. They take it. Yeah. It's funny you should say that because somebody else will be on this show is Chuck Klosterman, who started as he's in his 40s and he started as a writer out of Fargo, of all places, North Dakota. And, but, and, and again, and, and it, in many ways, much like you, he, he can't be defined as a writer in any particular genre. He writes about everything. He writes about sports. He writes about music. He writes about politics. He writes about everything, much like you do. And some of his stuff is funny and some of it is serious. It's all that sort of stuff. And he's had remarkable success. But now that you say it and I start thinking about it, you can't think of very many people in a Canadian context only that, are, that do that sort of thing. No. You've got to be pigeonholed in a lot of ways. You do have to be pigeonholed, yeah. Huh. Yeah. So for you, being in the States was a much better way to go, wasn't it? It was a much better way to go. The problem was that um, I <clears throat> was frequently told to pretend I was American. I remember Graydon Carter telling me that you, I, I couldn't get ahead unless I renounced my Canadian background. Um, my first book, I had to remove everything in my biography that was from Canada. Um, and that constant sort of um, advice to self-efface, self-erase, really, um, as somebody with my particular background yeah. in Canada, I, I just was, it was very uncomfortable. So that's why I came home. And how do you explain that desire then? I mean, they're open to people that they're not familiar with as writers, and yet they want you, is that, a, is that just American xenophobia? What is that? Or that if, if somehow somebody picks up your book and go, oh, well, she's Canadian, I'm not going to read this. I think on some level, Americans think Canadians all have Down syndrome. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, literally, Carlton Tucker said that oh, a couple of years ago okay. on Fox and Friends. You mean Tucker Carlson? Oh, Tucker Carlson. It's okay. It's the same. Sorry, I've had my own experience with him, too, so yeah. I, yeah, I know you mean and, bow tie and, and everything. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a weird snobbishness about their next-door neighbor. It's almost like an older sibling toward a younger sibling, that they don't feel toward the Australians, for instance. Yeah. Um, and so your credibility is diminished by the fact that you're that little kid from up north. Um, and I didn't want to deal with that. I just thought that was ridiculous. Yeah. I have to ask what your family background, how much, of it, how much that um, was an influence on what you decided to do for a living or the direction you decided to go. Your grandfather, of course, is a famous prime minister. You're, both of your parents, very active people in, in their own areas. What was it like growing up in that, in that milieu? Was it a very fostering sort of thing for you trying whatever what you wanted to try? I think the thing about, it's a funny thing because on the one hand, I, I've, I've always wanted to do what I am doing. I always mm. wanted to be a writer. So that was completely my own. On the other hand, um, I think my father was a writer monkey. I mean, I know he was. So he, he was the one who was kind of pushed into the Canadian diplomatic and political landscape by his background. <clears throat> but really what he wanted to do was he wanted to write James Thurber-style humor. Okay. You know, he loved that. He used to push it on me all the time. Yeah. Um, he used to, as I said at his memorial service, he literally would say something to me like, go, go make fun of people, Patricia. You know. <laughs> <laughs> he was like my, that version of a Little League dad. Only <laughs> satirist dad. Go make dad. fun of people. <laughs> she had a crocheted on yeah. her pillow. And, yeah. <laughs> so... In a way, I, you know, my, my own interest dovetailed with my father's desire to okay. live vicariously through me. Yeah. And so the, the, the great tragedy about when he died was that he used to love the New York Times crossword puzzle. And about four months after he died, my name was a solving clue in the crossword puzzle. Really? Yeah. Now, that's very cool. Wouldn't that have... I mean, no he would kidding. Have just, that would have been have, fabulous. Yeah, exactly. And then the second thing that happened after he died that I literally did deliberately for him was I said, okay, I'm going to write for the New Yorker for you guys and write humor for them. And so I did. Um, and, and those were his two That's great. You know, That's dreams. Great. 
Okay, let me ask you about, the, the last time you and I talked was about your book on anxiety. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I remember, like I've done a lot of interviews in my life and there are only certain ones I remember. That one I remember because basically it was <laughs> us talking about things that had afflicted both of us. So it was, it was weird. And I know that a lot of people who watched that were in exactly the same boat. But that book and this current one, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, you're, you're dealing on, with these serious topics of things that are very much a part of your life, a part of your, your existence, just, just taking something that is extant for you and then going into it in, in a big way to see how it touches everybody else. Um, that's, a very, that's very personal journalism as opposed to you picking a topic at random and saying, my next book's going to be on that. Um, why do you do that? Because these are, it seems to me that both of these books are the kinds of things that really uh, expose you personally in a lot of ways. And then you have to go around talking to people like me all the time about them, which seems another weird thing to do. That's the weird part, yeah. yeah. But <clears throat> um, I think I'm just compelled to make sense of things. If nothing exciting or terrible had happened in my life in the last five years, I would have likely found something else to make sense of. But it just happened that I needed to make sense of these experiences around the deaths of my father and sister. Mm -hmm. That was front and center what I had to do. Um, there was no way around it. I mean, it, I, I just, I had to make sense of it. I, I wasn't initially planning to do it as a book. I was doing research for my own purposes. Um, and in fact, it took me a while on this subject, not the anxiety, to be persuaded to write about it as a book because it felt so personal. Um, be persuaded by whom? My agent yeah. um, and my publisher. And um, yeah, it was about a year and a half before I agreed. And then it was another couple of years before I was really genuinely even comfortable writing about it. Yeah. Okay, just for the sake of, of an anchor for the rest of this conversation, Describe, if you will, and I know you've probably done this a million times now, but I'll have to ask you to do it one more time, what the, what the, the catalyst uh, events were for the beginning of this whole experience. Well, the catalyst event was um, a series of extraordinary um, experiences that started with the death of my father. So <clears throat> just the, about a week before the last time you interviewed me, actually. Um, my father died very unexpectedly. Um, and my sister was in Montreal, he was in Ottawa, and she woke up and, or uh, she was awake actually, she was sitting in her bedroom. Um, and she suddenly had this really um, inexplicable feeling. And I've subsequently talked to a number of other people who've had this, and it's very difficult to describe because it's almost like a, like an, a, a band of energy or something um, that she'd never experienced. And she recognized it as a, spiritual energy, although she didn't know what that meant. But she thought to herself, this is weird, I wonder if people are praying for me. And then she sensed a presence in her bedroom and then she felt hands cupping the back of her head. And then she had a couple of hours worth of feeling incredibly elated and content and joyful, which was a complete shift, a radical shift in mood for her. Um, and, and, then, and she talked about that um, to her son the more, in the morning. She just thought it was so bizarre and amazing. Yes. And then she found out that my father had died. Um, we set that aside. I mean, it, it, was, it was an extraordinary thing for our family, but we didn't really think about it much at the time because then she proceeded to die. Yeah. So she, she, and then when she was dying, um, we started to witness these sort of shifts in her consciousness in hospice. She was really lucky in a way because she, insofar as you can be lucky to die at 51, <clears throat> because she was in probably one of the best hospices in Canada, which is just because she happened to be living nearby. So this is the West Island, West Island Palliative Care Residence um, near Montreal. And they were just lovely. And, you know, the nurses would walk around barefoot and, you know, they would check at night with flashlight. Um, they let us have booze. They let us have candles. Yes. I've been you know, through this experience, so I know exactly what you mean. Right. Yeah. It yeah. makes such a difference. Yeah, you know, they weren't medicalizing it at all. It was entirely for the family. Um, and so in that, in that context, we were able to witness Catherine um, become very, very joyful and peaceful and radiant, radiant, you know, not resigned, but actually yeah. radiant um, and talking away to somebody I couldn't see. Um, anyway, th the whole thing was so galvanizing. 
because it, it, it rearranged my understanding of reality. And I had to make sense of that. Yes. Now, in, in doing the, the subsequent research <coughs> around this, uh, you have discovered that, and I, and I had a, an inkling of this as well. I just said I went through this experience. My wife died in the hospice a while ago. And though the end of her life wasn't like the end of your sister's life, sadly. But, uh, but at the time, I remember talking to the people who worked there. And I remembered it was a very, I, I've never experienced anything like that in my life. But the, the, they were talking to me about things that had happened there that they thought were unusual. But they were very circumspect about it, obviously, because those things don't get talked about because you start sounding like you might be a nut bar if you talk about it too loudly. But you discovered when you started doing this research that, in fact, this is, these sorts of experiences are not uncommon. In fact, they're really common, and people just haven't been talking about them. They're really common. That was the first thing I discovered, so, and, and that's what propelled me to continue the research, because I couldn't believe how many people were coming forth to me um, and saying, I've never told anyone this, but, and then unveiling a story that was either similar to what happened the night my father died or just in the context of a hospice setting. Um, and it, 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 some of the data is actually, it's around 50% of the bereaved population has some of these experiences. Um, and, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in our public discourse, because we're so obedient to the scientific paradigm, um, we, we acknowledge this may happen, but we immediately assume that it has to do with wishful thinking. So yes. it's like we've basically taken the entire population and turned them into credulous idiots. And we do that without even thinking. It's like, it, you know, stop and think what you're saying. You're literally saying that 50% of Canada is a bunch of idiots? You know, oh, well, but they're so emotional that, that you know, that the idiocy, you know, begins to suffuse them in this crisis. No, you know, it's not that simple because I knew my sister, you knew your wife. I mean, it's not, so I didn't accept that. Mm -hmm. So that's what kept me going further and further into it. The, it's funny because the, um, the behavior exhibited by most of the people who've experienced this is, you know, it, um, well, they're quiet, they don't talk about it, but, but for those who do talk about it, the reaction is either, you know, you're an idiot or it's wishful thinking or what you're describing about the person who was dying had to do with any number of scientific explanations, lack of oxygen. You go into all these in the book and looked at, at but it's always basically shunted aside as this is what happens when the synapses of the brain are shutting down, there isn't anything else, this is just some kind of way that, the, that a body shutting down copes with shutting down. Right. Your research seemed to indicate that that may not be the case at all. No, <clears throat> because all you have to do is take one person who's not physically dying and interview them about an experience that is, turns out to be identical to the experience of somebody who's had a near-death experience and encounters the immersion in the light. So if you take the experience as the basis of what you're, into, what you're looking at rather than the presumptive explanation and you go across these different boundaries and you start talking to extreme athletes who've had sense presences when they're high up on, well, I guess it's not an extreme athlete, it's up on Everest, but, mm -hmm. well, I guess they are. But anyway. They are to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, suddenly you find that there are people having these kinds of experiences in a whole variety of settings and what the actual common core is, is there is a cry from their soul for help. That's the common thread through these experiences. It's not whether they have low oxygen. It's not whether or not they are in high altitude. It's not whether or not their synapses are misfiring. It's that they somehow are in a position either of peril or danger or despair um, where the universe is somehow re reaching to them to reassure them. Give, can you give me a couple of examples? Can you crawl a couple of examples from the book that people might want to hear that would describe that more vividly? <clears throat> well, one example would be um, I interviewed a woman who was a doctor who was in a small plane flying out of a uh, remote First Nation reserve to Winnipeg mm -hmm. with her, her um, patient and the plane lost its propellers, or lost its engines. And it wound up heading down to the Lake of the Woods, and it hadn't crashed yet when she felt the fear that she felt and said, oh my God, I'm gonna die, and then um, was suddenly completely suffused with this sense of 
joy and peace. Um, it's hard to, like you, the problem is that it's all in the fine details. So you really have to take the whole story and really walk around it really, really carefully to chip away at all of the reductive explanations. But basically she, she found herself feeling extremely at peace and she heard a voice that said, be still. And so by the time the plane landed on the ice floe, she was in a position of being really, really calm and able to calm um, the patient. Um, and then in the effort of you know, getting out of the situation, she was never dying, but she was in the water trying to get uh, to land uh, with the pilot and the others, and she found herself going into this light. And so she was sort of out of body. She was watching herself swim, but she was in this light that wasn't a visual, but that was a, a full immersion, mm, emotional wisdom, sentient light. So, and that's what you hear from people who have near-death experiences when they're in a coma. That's what you hear from mystics. Um, that's what you hear from um, uh, people falling off the top of a mountain. Is is this the quality of this light is not um, uh, doesn't lend itself to a physical explanation. It's yeah. it's too complex. Did you have difficulty trying to describe, as you just did there, difficulty trying to describe it in the book? I'm wondering how, how you agonized over, some, I mean, often the descriptions are coming out of the mouths of the people you spoke to. But there are times in that book when you have to actually sort of synthesize all of that. And I thought at the time, boy, this is really diffi a difficult thing to describe to people, especially people who, are, who, are, who would doubt its, e its existence even. Well, it's, it's, it's what's called the unsayable or the ineffable experience. And um, it's part of what defines it is the fact that it's so hard to describe. So, um, in fact, it's, you know, there's an American philosopher of mine named William Frank who's just written a book called The Unsayable, talking about it as sort of the philosophical dilemma of our time. Because you, you, the best way to even get at what they're trying to convey in this experience is to listen to their emotional tone. So even my putting it in a book in two dimensions takes away from the power, the power of the of experience, it, yes. yeah, no, right? I understand that, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so that's a trick. About um, a year or so ago, I guess, on this program, we interviewed Andrew Solomon. Um, oh, yeah. And a brilliant guy and a really nice guy. But one of the things that I talked to him about at the time was he, he had described in an article, I think, in, in, in The New Yorker, if I'm not mistaken, a number of years ago, when his mother had died. Um, she died of a, um, it, was, it was a planned death, as they put it. She, she committed suicide, but it was all arranged and pre-planned and done, and he was there when it happened. And he wrote, at the time, and I asked him about this because I thought it was intriguing, he wrote, um, you know, one minute she was there, and the next minute she wasn't. But for him, that didn't um, suggest that that was the end of everything, as I told him, as it frankly did for me, and still, though I'm not so sure having read your book now whether I believe this anymore, but at the time, I didn't have that experience. My wife was there and she was gone, and I thought, well, now she's gone. She's gone. That's it. Um, his take on that, though, when his mother died, was she was there one moment, she wasn't there the next, but I know there is something else. And this is a very well-educated, very intelligent man, and I said, is that religion? And he said, not necessarily. And I guess that's what a lot of this is. I mean... Talk about the religious aspect of this. Has it changed you, your idea about religion at all? All the things that you discovered in researching this book? Or is this something else entirely? For me, this is a, is a book about, it's a, about phenomenology. So it's about, <clears throat> it's about what people experience. And then how our understanding of what people experience reinforms what we understand about scripture and about any kind of text. So, for example... When you've done a bunch of research on the sensed presence phenomenon, and you know how common it is right now in this world in the 21st century for people to sense vividly sense a presence in you know coming to their aid or reassuring them or whatever, then you go back and you look at something like the Bible and you say, well, you know maybe those shepherds did see an angel, phenomenologically they did probably. If we are, they certainly did, and so then you realize that. Um, it's, we're, 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 we're imposing these kinds of prejudices back through history um, that you, re, you reconsider. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. I mean, this is going to sound ridiculous, but even just in terms of um, something like the resurrection of Christ, I mean, 
it wasn't uncommon for people to see dead people walking around. So you have to revisit that whole thing and say, well, what was it about that that was so galvanizing to them? Because they accepted the fact that 50% of the bereaved population sensed presence. We don't happen to, but every other era in human history has. Yes. So, it, so for me, it's not a, so much about, you know, where does this lead my, me to understand, um, uh, you know, to take a, a stance and a belief in God. And it's more trying to, to re-understand human culture in terms of having respect for human experience. Yeah. I mean, you do, just to go back a second, when you talk about the... the you know, seeing dead people walking around. In fact, many of these sensed presence experiences that you document in the book, people you've talked to, actually have been the physical manifestation of, of a relative that, they, that shouldn't have been there. Yes. Whether they were dead or in some other part of the planet. I mean, it was... Yes. And as a reviewer wrote about my book, and I really appreciated this line, these are not ghost stories, they're love stories. Yeah. So it'll be somebody lying in their bed and they will feel the tactile presence of their husband who died four years earlier and for some reason on that particular night they feel that the indentation on they feel it tactically my sister felt hands on her back yeah of her it head. wasn't yeah it was she, she actually felt a physical yeah. presence yeah yeah um, about five percent of it is a visual so it's pretty rare to have the visual hallucination of the person um, but I've come across countless cases where that's how somebody knew somebody died was that they saw them at the end of their bed yeah. um, sometimes it's auditory um, my theory about it, which is based on absolutely nothing, because I have no expertise in terms of a theory, but is that there's some interplay between gleaning that something is there or something has happened and then projecting, um, kind of the way your, your brain processes um, dream imagery from, like, your alarm clock going off. Okay. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So, so there is a real external stimulus, which is the alarm clock, but your brain is processing it in an unaware way. And so I think something similar is going on. So people somehow know that somebody close to them is in distress or has died, um, but they don't know it consciously. And there's that instantaneous processing of the information. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to, who knows? Yeah. Okay, in, in our last minute then, uh, I said that I, I have reassessed certain things having read this book. I will give it to some people I know to read as well. Did it, has it changed you in, in any kind of fundamental way? Uh, it's made me more humble. And it's made me more um, hopeful. Thanks a lot for doing this, Patricia. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay.